Hi, Amanda. Hey. hey. Um, welcome to Shame Spiral. I first just want to acknowledge that it's insane that you agreed to do this, and I'm so excited that you're here. Why? <laughs> because you're like a mega celebrity. I, I feel like <laughs> this is a brand new podcast, and it's just so kind of you. I am. Um, I, you know, we know each other through very, 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 very dear friends, family, mm-hmm. really. And I just, I've been wanting to hook up with you guys for a while because our kids are this, around the same age and, and, um, I follow you on Instagram and I'm, I like your vibe. And <laughs> I'm also on vacation. So it's like kind of perfect yeah, timing. I'm, that's so to talk about shame. Yeah. It's, I mean, for me, it's always perfect timing because obviously I think about shame all the time or I wouldn't be doing this podcast. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's what, that's what we're built on. We're built on shame, which is, it's a shame. It is a shame. I have, oh my, I was going to ask you something else, but now I just need you to expound upon what, what you mean when you say we're built on shame. Like, what does that mean to you? It seems like all the triggers and all the issues that I come up against personally as I evolve, as I grow, as I learn about myself through therapy, through friendships, through relationships, I think that it all comes down to shame. And I don't know, I wish it wasn't so, but it seems like shame is the, is when you get to the root of things, it's usually, it usually has to do with shame and, and, and we're built in a way that, you know, from, such a young age to immediately feel that Mm -hmm. emotion. And I don't understand why that's true and how to, especially as a mother, how to (laughs) prevent it Mm -hmm. and how, how much is, how much is necessary or, or do, or doesn't need to exist at all. I mean, embarrassment, shame, it, it, it's all very natural and all very healthy to a point, right? Mm-hmm. But how much is too much and how often do you need to bang into it? Yeah. Um, some people, you know, know what shame feels like and know, and they understand themselves enough to know that that's what they're feeling. And, and then self-knowledge is everything. And then you can like evolve from that. But if you don't know, if, if a five-year-old is feeling shame and they don't know how to understand that, um, then, you know, does that, does it grow into something else much worse? Mm-hmm. You know, I, do. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're that, that I am. And that, that's such a good, um, question. And I love the idea. I mean, I don't love it. I kind of hate it, but, um, the, what you said made me think about how, how much it's about whether, you know, it's there or not, like how you relate to it. Because if you don't know that that's what you're feeling, it just feels like it's the truth, you know, and then you can't lift it off of yourself and be like, Oh, that's, that's my shame. That's my shame voice. Let me decide in this moment how I want to relate to it, which doesn't always go well, but at least you have the ability to kind of pause and see it as something that you have the option of relating to in a number of ways. Yeah. Relating to it. It's like, that's the thing that we don't want to do. It almost feels instinctual not to relate to our shame or to want to discover more about it because it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Like this is (laughs) like alcoholism and drug addiction and sex addiction and you name it, it it's a way of controlling the pain related to shame. Mm-hmm. I know. And if you get to know your shame and you have some kind of, like you said, relationship to it, it can, I mean, it can make all the difference in, in, in your life. And I, I see it with people and I, friends of mine, I, I, I recognize where their behavior is coming from sometimes. And it's often because of 
shame that, that doesn't have any place in their lives anymore. Yeah, I know. It's tricky. It <sighs> is. I feel like that's so true about so much of the choices that, I mean, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I don't know if you know that about me, but like definitely when, when I was drinking and using so much of it was about outrunning that feeling as fast as I could and whatever method I could find to not feel it. But then of course, the more we sort of lock something away, like the bigger and more powerful it grows, et cetera, et cetera. I also just want to take a meta moment and say that I knew you were going to be so awesome to talk to on this podcast and that it would go like right in right away. And I want to tell you why, which is because you and I have only actually spoken one time before now. It was like a three minute conversation. I don't know if you remember it, but my memory, my memory, I had just had my first daughter, Goldie. She was a newborn. She was so tiny. She was so small. She was a baby, baby. And um, I like, I said hi to you. I think I had her with me. And then I don't know how it happened, but like, two seconds into our conversation, I started talking to you about how I was having all these intrusive thoughts about touching Goldie's little soft spot on her skull, which if anyone listening like doesn't know about newborns, like they have this little soft spot and it doesn't harden until they're like six months old or something. Right. And I just launched into that. Or older. Yeah. And you were just like, Oh my God, totally. (laughs) And and I know now, now (laughs) I know that you've talked openly about OCD and anxiety and I also have OCD, but I don't think I knew that about you then. And some, for some reason, like your vibe, like I just knew that it was a safe space to be like, I think you were just like, how's your baby? And I was like, well, listen, I'm having an intrusive thought and you were just so there with me. It was so healing to just talk about it for a second. And then we were like, bye, see you later. That's really nice. <laughs> Do you remember that? I know it was, it was so quick. We were, um, we were at Williams or well, we were at the, uh, the Clark. At Williamstown. Because right? that's where they, at Williamstown. Yeah. yeah. And that, and we were doing a reading of Basil's play. And I think Tommy was, my husband was, somebody was, I think it was yeah, Tommy. I, feel like I think it was. It was. Anyway, it was, it, but, but of course I was. And and I think I think um, Nina was just a, almost just a little older. I think they're a year apart, mm-hmm. maybe and um, maybe less. And all I ever want to do is talk mom and talk about postpartum. And I just it was a whole new world for me. In order, and it was a, a way of coping with. I mean, I felt like the postpartum experience, as hard as it was, was healing in a lot of ways because it it kind of let me off the hook. Mm. I let myself off the hook because it was so hard. I was just able to feel how hard it was and not try to fix it Yeah, or look ahead to the future. I had to just deal in the moment. And for someone with OCD, it's, it's a, it's an exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just, I also, I'm just, I gravitate towards new moms and you were, you know, you have a really open energy and, and it's true. Like I had the same intrusive thoughts. Um, it was always like, am I going to stick something sharp accidentally in the soft spot? And open? I mean, like, I know. the imagery that I have is insane. And I just, I have to turn it off. And I'm really good at mm-hmm. it now because I've been doing it for so long. But, That's amazing. Oh. I'm so glad. I feel that way too. I mean, I credit, like I've taken Lexapro and Zoloft kind of interchangeably for years. And I credit that a lot but I also had to work really hard on it in therapy too. Like I have another baby now, Birdie, who's um, 14 months. And one of my intrusive thoughts I was just telling my therapist about the other day is I'll be walking down the stairs and then it'll just be like, what if I just threw her down the stairs? (laughs) And I was telling my therapist and I was laughing about it because I was like, I have the ability now to be like, that is such a crazy thought. Like that is actually the last thing I would ever want to do with Birdie, which is why I'm having the thought and how silly. And then I can just let it, let it go by. But that took years. Like I, for so long, I was like, I'm a terrible person. And the shame was attached to all of That's, it. It's, this is the problem. It, I was so ashamed of myself throughout my whole adolescence. And because I 
didn't want to tell people how crazy I was because that exact thing, you are old enough to know that those thoughts are, are, do not at all describe who you are or what you want Mm -hmm. at all. It's just your biggest fear. And I, oh my God, I lost so much sleep and so many years of my life, I think from anxiety while I wasn't early adolescent up until I was maybe oh, 19 and which is when I started seeing somebody and started getting on, on Lexapro and God, like this is, this is so important for kids to know that there's, there just isn't enough education on that. Maybe there will be when our kids are, pre-adolescence, adolescent age, but how do we tell our kids that when they have thoughts that they're scared of or feelings that they're scared of, that they can talk about Mm -hmm. it? Because as soon as you communicate these things to somebody else, you no longer have the control over it. You no longer have, it, it no longer lives in you alone. And it doesn't fe- it doesn't have the power to fester and i just became so wrapped up and i really did think i was going to you know accidentally kill my parents mm-hmm. in a way that really i truly i was afraid to go to bed after they went to bed like i needed to be in bed and asleep before they went to bed because the night was so terrifying and i remember it get it was exacerbated by the fact that I remember this clearly one summer, my best friend had gone on vacation for a week and because she wasn't around, I was able to think about it more and, and fear it more because my biggest fear was losing my parents yeah. at that age. That That is a lot of people's yeah. biggest fear. And I was like, the worst that can happen is if I kill them mm-hmm. myself. And that is, that equals OCD. I know. And if someone had told me that, I wouldn't have even needed medicine maybe. If someone had just told oh, me that. I know. I had I had a really similar experience. No, I did not know I had OCD until I was like, I'm going to tell you, I think until I was like 32. And yes. And I thought that, yeah, that I was a horrible person and that my thoughts meant a lot about who I was and exactly what you just said. Like, like as long as I control the narrative and keep these thoughts to myself. No, at least no one will ever know that I'm a terrible person. And yeah, if someone had noticed my anxiety as a kid and been like, oh, this is actually OCD. Like your thoughts actually are garbage. They don't mean anything about you. Let's figure out how you can start to relate to them different. I feel like I don't even know who I would be, you know? (laughs) It's so wild. I know. I how much of a chance would we have had if like, if we had nipped that in the bud? I know. Like, I know. Uh, 15 years earlier. It's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, I mean, but, but, but also maybe, maybe we needed it. Maybe I like to think that it helped us in some, I mean, I like to think that my OCD helps me in some ways in terms of my, like my job my yeah. acting, but, but I would have loved to not walk it have walked in fear for so many years yeah i would have loved to have engaged with somebody else about that about these i love that you're like your thoughts are garbage <laughs> i mean that's the thing it's kind of true these thoughts are there why are they there to protect us mm, no because we have a chemical imbalance, maybe, but also the way we were raised mm-hmm. or, you know, how often our parents worked or whether or not we had both parents around or, you know, it's just, it's just to, you know, you can't, you can't pre- prevent this kind of thing um, completely. But I, I definitely like my job now is to talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Openly. I love and I love and respect so much that you use your platform in that way. And you talk openly about things that you've struggled with and still struggle with. It's so, um, it's such a gift really like not to be too corny about it, but I feel like, yeah, so many, so many kids are going to hear that 
And maybe they, maybe they don't have anyone in their orbit personally who maybe they would be like we were, you know, but then maybe they don't have to be because you're kind of being generous in that way. I think that's awesome. I just felt so, um, I, I just, I felt like I was trapped in my own hell for way too long and it's just, there's no, it's not necessary. Yeah. Like it's doesn't, it didn't serve me. I really don't think that that kind of anxiety, high anxiety served me at all. Mm-hmm. Parts of my OCD maybe, but that level of fear just didn't serve me. And I don't think it serves anybody. I think it just, you know, it, it, it made me consider you know, not being around like, for you know, I, I didn't have suicidal ideations. Um, I wasn't suicidal at all, but I would, I would, I would panic so much that it would be a thought like, is that better? Yeah. And, and, and the answer was always like, no, it's not better. Mm-hmm. But I, but, but there was no other option either. Right. I was just like, I'd rather live with it. Right. Which is, fine but like or i wish it had felt like i could have just thought oh no i can talk to i know <laughs> why didn't i think to do that well you just don't unless unless it's in the landscape you know it's like like when i think about our kids like yeah. they're going to know all they already know that like they can that we're welcoming their inner worlds and that there's permission and they can talk to anyone. They're going to be like, okay, I know I got it. And it's like, if you don't have that, you don't know. You just think you got to keep it on lockdown. So true. It's so true. I, every time she comes up to me, is like, I'm feeling this way. I'm like, okay, all right, let's, uh, let's talk about it. What, what, you know, it's just, what, there's always there's already an open line of communication and and I feel like <laughs> it's already 100 yeah, percent different absolutely and it's not my parents fault it's just it's just it yeah it's just yeah. The, the atmosphere totally um so <laughs> we just got like right down into it which I love but I'm gonna ask you a question I usually ask people at the beginning which is um you know it's it's, it can be intense to like, know that you're coming on a podcast to talk about shame. And like, that's the, that's sort of what you're walking directly into. And so how, I mean, now we've been talking for a little while, but how how do you, how did you feel kind of like coming in today? And how are you feeling now about doing this? You know, like what, what's your, what's your anxiety like, like one to 10 about getting into all of this shame stuff? Oh, um, as a, as a person very tight with my PR people, (laughs) I feel like I finally learned to check myself and be like, okay, when are you oversharing? Like what, what you don't need to tell the, the mailman coming up here you know, when the last time you had your period was, you know what I mean? Like, obviously I don't do that, but like, <laughs> it's on the line. Yeah, why not? <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, that, that's a, yeah. Um, but I, I also feel like I don't do this very often and I, I love talking about mental health. Yeah. I don't think I can, I, I don't think you can really go wrong. Obviously, obviously like your words carry weight, you know, my words carry weight to some people. And I've, I've seen the effects of it over the years with like fan mail and stuff like that. And like people reaching out and it just all means that like when I feel compelled to talk about something that I think is interesting with somebody who I think is interesting. Um, I, I feel like it's a good idea. I mean, I don't, I don't like, I don't love doing this stuff um, because it's usually tacked on to, to promoting something mm-hmm. and that ends up, it's just really intense and you do a lot of them, but 
I think because this is very specific and it doesn't have anything to do with anything I'm promoting. I mean, I, of course I'll talk about stuff I'm proud of, but in my work life, but at the same time, like I'm coming in at more as a human and because there are people out there who know who I am and, and will want to hear what I have to say. I feel like it's like, why, why not? I mean, I guess I get, I don't get really, the anxiety is not really there. I mean, I don't think I can, I'm, I hope I can't ruin anyone's life with my words. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God, Amanda. You know what I mean? That's, right? You know, I'm just like, will it be for good or for – no. But um, I'm just also a chatterbox. I, uh, oh, my God. Ruin anybody's life with my words. I totally relate to that. My, yeah. That's, I just don't want to – I just don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. You yeah. know, if that's how I walk through the earth and I'm trying my best to chill out and speak my truth knowing that I'm, I, I speak from a place of kindness, yeah. right? You've got to trust yourself at some point, right? Especially if you're Yeah. Not. Yeah. I have a lot of shit. Yes. Um, I do. yeah. I feel like what I tell myself when I have thoughts like that, like, I don't want to ruin anybody's life with my words or behavior or whatever is that like my words aren't that powerful. Like it might seem like they are, but actually they're not. <laughs> You know, and that that's a relief. They are. As a therapist. Oh my God, no, don't do this to me. They're not. (laughs) Okay, I hear. They, it depends on, it depends, it's all context. Okay, okay, I hear you. You're right. My words are impactful and they matter. But also, like, for example, if I make a mistake in a therapy session, like hurt someone unintentionally, and then I need to repair it. Like that is, that's a really important part of therapy, but, um, but also it's so important, I think, to make, to keep your impact right-sized. Like, even if that was hurtful, um, like I'm not actually going to ruin that person's life. You know what I mean? Like, I I think, yeah. Right. There's responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. There are lines of responsibility in how people react to things. If you own that you had said something out of turn or they their feelings, it's the same thing with with my daughter. It's like, you hurt me. And it's like, well, you you're feeling uh-huh. hurt because it's something I said, and I'm really uh-huh. sorry. But I didn't hurt you. You're feeling it's just there's a difference and that's yes in terms of impact if you own that you said something that um you know caused some feelings you know that's your responsibility Mm -hmm. but how the people it's all the reaction to it it's just that's what i'm learning no totally it's like how much can i control i know it's really complicated so your your anxiety is really low, it sounds like. Are you at like a zero or is it like a one or two because of that fear of the, the impact of your words? My anxiety is probably if one to 10 in my the whole, my whole life, um, I'm probably at like a three, like a good steady three, which is just, I also, I will be honest, like I, I had kids. Um, I'm having like a good moment of success in work. My life is feeling very busy. Um, but because of my kids, I feel like I'm able to prioritize mm-hmm. and I kind of know where I want to be when I want to be. So I have a lot more control over my life and that's part of mm. OCD. So I love uh-huh. it. But um, I think I'm just at a steady three, honestly, because um, I think I found what, works for me chemically. Mm -hmm. And even when I'm feeling like super, super anxious, I'll I'll like pop some CBD, which I have found really helpful, but it's, you know, I, after I had my first kid, I went up on my Lexapro because I'd only been on a, a 10 for years and years and years. And I went up and it changed Mm -hmm. my life. I was like, Oh shit. I've been on the wrong dose. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then after I had my second, my son, I, I went up again to the 
pretty therapeutic dose of, I mean, it, it depends yeah. on the person, but from the research and from the doctors that I've spoken to and from my doctor, you know, 20 is a pretty standard yeah. dose of, of, of Lexapro, which is what I'm on. And I really, <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I do a lot of work, but I have, there's so much less work to yep. do. Yeah. That's such a great way to put it. I can't even, It it's just, I got so, I have so many responsibilities and I'm already anxious. I'm an anxious person. My baseline is, is energetic. And I have two kids who are being shaped by my decisions and my behaviors and my presence. It's like, I, you know, I can't fuck around. Yeah. Um, which is another reason I went up postpartum. Yeah. It was po- both postpartum periods mm-hmm. I went up, which is, which is recommended yeah. for people with, with OCD yeah. um, in my so- circle of doctors. And so it was really smart. <laughs> it was a really smart mm-hmm. decision and I'm really proud of that decision. And I think I'm also like coming to the point where I'm just really proud of the way I've handled the OCD that I, you know, that's, that's a new thing mm-hmm. for me, a level of like confidence and acknowledgement that it's hard and I don't need to carry the rock up the hill if I can use a medicine. Yeah, that it doesn't have to be that hard, you know, like you don't need to suffer needlessly when there's the option, exactly. the option to turn that dial down. I, I really like how you put it about like working hard, but you don't have to work quite as hard. Like it doesn't actually have to be like pushing a boulder to deal with the anxiety. It can just, it can maybe turn into like a manageable rock, you know, which is really different than a giant boulder, you know, with like. A- yeah. And I prefer a, a manageable yeah. rock. Like I want the rock. I don't want the rock to be gone because then if the rock's gone, you're going to be like, oh no, a giant boulder is going to fall down from the sky and kill me. Like things are too <laughs> yeah, yeah. good. That's oh yeah. Issue. You don't want things to be too good. That's terrifying. <laughs> no, that is the worst. Oh, I know. Every time I have a success. <laughs> that is the end of time. I, know. Every, I, I don't know about you. Every time I have a success, it takes me like 30 seconds to turn it into a crisis. Like the turnover is so fast. <laughs> I know. Wow. So you get 30 seconds. At least you get 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I guess. And- no, I, I don't know how to remedy that. How I do you remedy know. that? I try to just laugh about it. Like I try to be like playful and like teasing toward myself because that's what works best for me. Like if I can kind of relate to myself about it in a loving way, or like this is just what you do. Like that's, I feel like when I'm at my best is if I'm able to do that rather than take myself extremely seriously like get all Morrissey vibes about it where I'm all, I'm just like, Oh, woe is me. I'm so intense. You know, I, oh God, it's so helpful to be playful. It's something my therapist talks a lot about and it's so true. It, it may seem like a minor, um, like a, a minor fix, but it's actually like pretty massive. Oh, yeah. If you could be playful about anything, because I bet you you're that way with your kids, right? I try to be. Yeah. Try. Sometimes it's hard. I mean, we need to, we need discipline and everything, but it's still like to be playful about, to be curious and playful. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, uh, that's just you. No, it's just, this is what you do. This is what you uh-huh. do. It's okay. Maybe check yeah. yourself. This is <laughs> yeah. what you do. It's like exactly. very kind as opposed to Morrissey vibes. You just, you know, harder. Yeah. Like we make it harder on ourselves yeah. too. What is it? Is it, is it just, do we like the shame spiral? What is it? Oh, I don't know. I feel like in my twenties, I thought it was my personality and I got a little bit into that, you know, like I'm angsty, you know, I'm tortured. And there was something I got from that. Like there was some way it served me at the time. I don't know. What about you? Power. Um, I think I didn't really know what it was. Well, no, I guess I did. I was just always assuming that's the way I was always going to be, I guess. 
I was always going to find something wrong with the situation, something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Like the minute something goes wrong, it's my fault. Ugh. Yeah. And, and then trying to bury that. Yeah. Like it, it grows. It just grows. So funny. I was just like, what, what, what was it in my life? I can't pinpoint a moment in my life where I was a really bad person. So therefore, why did I feel so much shame? Shame for what? Peeing in my pants when I was four years mm-hmm. old while I was planning my wedding to my five-year-old boyfriend. <laughs> like shame for putting a kick me sign on someone's back. That's not mm-hmm. that bad. What, what, like, I, I remember all these very, very, very specifically, almost like they were yesterday. And I don't know how I could have, how that shame has been earned. I know. <laughs> of course, that's not the way it works, but where, where is it coming? What, what did we kill people? Have we killed anybody? <sighs> no, not, not to my knowledge. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not to my knowledge either. What well, imagine if we had? I know. That's my bit. Well, we that, wouldn't be. You know, my, what my like core nightmare that I've had since I was a kid is that I've, I kill someone accidentally and then I get away with it. And then I, but I know that I have to live with the knowledge that I've murdered someone for the rest of my life. And like, that's the punishment. You know what I mean? Um, oh, okay. I feel like we could chat forever. I'm going to, um, not artfully transition us into something that I'm, that is the shame game, (laughs) which will continue the conversation, but in a different way. So, you know, shame is different. Shame is different for everybody. Like what makes me spiral might not make you spiral. So I'm going to ask us both a few questions about it's kind of like, would you rather, but what would make you spiral more? Do you know what I mean? Okay. Okay. I don't, you'll, you'll understand when I say it. Okay. So which would make you spiral more losing your cool and yelling at a customer service representative or losing your cool and yelling at somebody you really love? Oh yeah. Customer okay. service beyond. Definitely. Oh, and uh-huh. why? <laughs> because, because my family knows me and I would, get them back and they, they understand me and I am seen by them and I would apologize and make it all right. But because, and this is, a, this is like a real big issue between in our, in my relationship with, with Tommy, it's just like, he's like, why are you, why do you treat strangers better than, than that you treat me? And I'm like, well, because I have you and I'm seen by you. And I just fully just want to, like, I just want to be understood. Yeah. <laughs> and that person, I would, I would, I mean, you said yelling, losing your cool and yelling at a customer service rep. And I, my, my anxiety, I could went see up. it in your like face. It went up to a I four know. or a five. I saw it in your face. <laughs> what is that? It's such a great question. Thanks. It's really smart. Thank you. What uh, about you? That's, mm, yeah, I think same, same because they, they, well, can I tell you what actually just almost came out of my mouth is because they didn't deserve it. <laughs> Which is so funny because because I'm sure my family doesn't deserve it either. But it is that thing. Like, they're safe. Like, they love me. I love them. We can have a repair. I'm a full person, whatever. But a customer service representative just trying to do their job, like, oh. And I just can imagine, like, I've had really shitty jobs in the past. And just the way that that must feel just being dehumanized i would i would go dark about like i am i'm a bad person like that was a that was a bad person way to be in that moment and i can't take it back there's no repair because you'll never talk to that person again yeah okay yeah um, yeah yeah it's it's that's it is thing. okay yeah. next question okay which would make you spiral more getting angry and frustrated with your therapist, like really challenging them or pushing back or something, or I wish everyone could see what your eyes just did or realizing that you were (laughs) realizing that you were lying to your therapist um, and like denying the sort of reality, which is that you actually are angry and frustrated with them. Oh yeah, no. The first, I would, I just wouldn't. 
I wouldn't, I'm not a, I don't come, I'm not a confrontational mm. person. I'm allergic to confrontation. Mm. I'm allergic to confrontation between other people. Like if there's a confrontation between other people, I'm going to run the other You way. don't even <laughs> want to be around it. I don't want any part of that. Wow. Why is that? Nope. Not at all. I don't know. You know, it's funny. My co-star right now is very confrontational and very comfortable with it. And he very directly said, can everybody just be quiet, please? Normal, complete, completely asked for what he needed. And I basically just like from my heart in like imploded and turned into like a ball. Mm. What are those little um, toys that turn into balls? Oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. I forgot what that's called, though. All he did was ask for quiet in a specific way. He wasn't even yelling. And I was like, I can't be, I, I can't be here. I can't handle. And it was, it was only a moment. Of course I can mm-hmm. function, but for uh, one nanosecond, I became a, a popple. <laughs> a popple. <laughs> yeah. Like it was, did it feel, it does it feel close. unsafe to be around it? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So it feels unsafe to do it yes. even more. It feels like I'm a terrible person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I get that. I would probably, I'd probably go with the second one because, yeah, if if my therapist was directly like, "Are you angry with me?" and I said no, I would leave, and and probably spiral about like. That was so, that was so weak. Like you're there to tell the truth. Like, how is this even helping you if you can't be honest? Why are you so afraid of your own feelings and confrontation and all that? That's very healthy though. Like that's absolutely the healthier choice. Um, I mean, in terms of, sorry, the, the healthier reaction to that choice. I mean, it's the healthier reaction to that choice because I, my reaction to that choice would be it. it in relation to yeah. my reaction to that choice, which would be, um, yeah, good. Let it go. <laughs> you don't need to tell her that. That's not necessary. Yeah. Put it, swipe it on. Yeah, road. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at least, at least you would have chosen the easier way out. And then, yeah, you would have shame spiraled um, because you didn't say it because you want to do the right thing. Whereas I would have shame spiraled if I had done the right mm-hmm. thing because I, don't want to be at odds with yeah. my therapist. Yeah, and it sounded almost like it, it sounded almost like you would feel like um, accomplished. Like you did a good job sweeping it under the rug. You were strong, you know. Which is total bullshit. <laughs> it's like total garbage. But but it's like at least your therapist is okay, and you're like, but but that's not my. Res- that's the thing I say to myself, Amanda. That's not your responsibility. I know. Your responsibility is to be honest. And and here I am like, nah. I know. I know. I get it. Um, okay. Last one. And this is kind of silly. Okay. Which would make you spiral more. Your dentist during a cleaning telling you that you have bad breath or someone that you're making out with that you really like telling you that you have bad breath. Oh, making. Oh, really? I I mean, for sure. Oh my God. (laughs) I would, I would never talk to that person again. Oh my God. I would become the size of a tiny pebble and I would run away. I would never, I was dating somebody once and this is so sad. Um, I was 19 or 20 we had gone on a bunch of dates and I was like what I thought head over heels um, with him. And he, I was like, Hey, why didn't you, why didn't you kiss me last night? And he's like, because I thought you had herpes on your lip. And I was like, but it's a pimple. Like I, I get these little ingrown hairs on my lip <laughs> for sure a week was so embarrassed and felt so ashamed 
that I couldn't even, I, I couldn't, I couldn't even deal. I couldn't even deal because I liked him so much and he was just being honest, but he could have asked me and been like, is that herpes? Yeah. Um, because he made it seem like it was disgusting and dirty. Um, that's his thing. I mean, he's, he was definitely problematic and it didn't last very long, but the amount of shame that I felt because he was like, I didn't want to kiss you because you had herpes. Like that guy's a loser, but also I felt, I felt disgusting because he made, because he, you know, mm-hmm. I was, I wasn't kissable because I had this pimple and I was just like, I'm, I'm use, I'm nothing. Ugh. I'm useless. And like, I what? He, that much power it was I insane. Uh, especially when you're young, those you moments know? are so brutal. I think, I think for me quickly, it would probably, they're both horrifying to me, but it would probably be, um, the dentist because I would feel like I've subjected you to my stink, like at your job and you you don't deserve that. Like, like I wasn't even sort of a good enough person to think about how my bad breath would impact you while you're just trying to do your job, you know? Um, oh, I know, but God. It's, a, it's okay. It's okay. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Did it happen? It didn't happen. It didn't happen. No, it's just something so. that I thought about. Um, okay. So it's, well, they're both terrifying, both terrifying in their own right. Like both. So exhaustingly scary. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just a good, they're, they're, uh, each of these questions, each of these choices were, I mean, it really makes you, this is like a therapy session for me, by the way. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> but you know that that one has, but they're just good questions. That I love, I love that. I'm so glad the dentist one has never happened to me, but the, um, I once d- was dating someone I really liked who told me that I had bad breath when we were making out. And I was so mortified. Like I used to have an OCD thing where I, I couldn't, um, be with people unless I had recently brushed my teeth. So that's, that's like a whole, so it's, it was, has a particular thing for me, bad breath. And I was so horrified. They were, they were so, um, great about it. They forced me in a playful way to just breathe directly into their face when they saw how upset I was. Like they were just like, it's fine. Get over it. Like just breathe right in my face. And I was like, no. And then they made me do it. And then I did feel kind of a little better after, but yeah, it was terrifying. It was horrible. (laughs) Yeah. I still, I had a nightmare the other night that I was on like a date, which was very strange because I, I don't remember. I mean, I have a lot of nightmare. I have my dream life is crazy. Um, but it was, it was like, I was on a date and I didn't have any gum. Uh huh. And I was like, this, that's it. Nothing's happening. Like yeah. I, I chewed so much gum in high school. Me too. And in my early twenties, I just couldn't, my biggest fear was that one of my biggest fears, obviously I had a lot of them, but that was a big fear that, you know, I would have bad breath or someone would think that. Yeah. And God. Oh God. my God, me too. And as we're talking about it, I just had this thought that it's almost like the bad breath is a metaphor for people seeing your like disgusting inner truth. And I feel like maybe that's why it was so like, that's why I was actually obsessed with it. Like, like it would show them something about me that I really didn't want them to know. You know what I mean? That feels really Freudian. Right? Oh, I don't know. I'm not. Is that Freudian or Jungian? It, it could be Jungian. It could be Kleinian. I'm not really up with my old dead psychi- psychologists, but um, it could be. It could be all of those. I'm going to, I'll look it up. Um, okay. I want to hear your story that you brought of shame. But before you tell your story, one more question, um, which is, especially as we've been talking about shame for a while now, if your shame was like an animal or a kind of person or a creature of some kind, like what's, what do you think it would be just like gut 
image that pops to mind? Oh, God. The gut. I mean, the first thing I, that popped in would be like an armadillo. Mm. I don't like the shape of them. I just think they're, I'm just not into them. Mm. And I'm not into my shame. Yeah. But uh, I don't know why I thought of an armadillo. Yeah, I just that's interesting. Did. Well, it's something you don't like. Like maybe there was an association. Yeah, I'm just yeah, and they're not. They don't seem very smart. Mm. Yeah, you know, I don't think I would. I don't think they're. I mean, maybe they're pretty well respected in the animal kingdom, but for <laughs> me, they just seem um, uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah, they. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. I've never seen one. Me neither. I just, I'm picturing it and I'm just not, I'm not, it's not a good yeah, vibe. Yeah. <laughs> do you have an animal? Um, do you have an animal or a, an alien? Yeah. I, I was just telling someone else about this, that mine is, mine is kind of like a goblin-y like gremlin who, who like l- lurks around like drooling and like, like sort of overseeing everything I do and being like bad, you know, with like a kind of lurch, like almost like a, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or something like that. Terrifying. I know. Yeah, I was like, is, is the gremlin wearing a cape? Cause I'm picturing the, a cape. I feel like the gremlin <laughs> and a scepter. I feel like the, yeah, a scepter. I feel like the gremlin is more naked and kind of like exposed, like, you know, where you want to look away, but you can't. Um, does the gremlin have boobs that like reach down to its? I love button? that because mine yep, would. Yep, I get that. Uh huh. Saggy boobs. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Yep. Just in case Amanda was about to ruin somebody's <laughs> life with that comment, please be known nothing that there's wrong nothing with it. wrong with saggy I'm just, boobs. <laughs> I'm just feeling. I'm just feeling the sag these days. Yes, but. You know, they're like medals of yeah, honor. The post because... breastfeeding sag. Yeah, I get it. I know. <laughs> it's fine. I know it's fine. <laughs> All you need is a good bra. <laughs> All you need is a good bra. Um. So okay. So tell me. I asked you to bring bring a story to share of something that caused you a lot of shame that you've carried around with you. So when you're ready, why don't you jump in? I want to press uh, preface this by saying it's really boring, but it's the, literally the thing that I have never stopped thinking about <sighs> because I was so young. I think I was six and I put a kick me sign on a kid's back and I'm telling you it like was the beginning of a, a new version of mm-hmm. me. Cause I like to fuck with people. I like to jump on people's back. I like to scare people I, you know, I even like put pants on my sister's head and made her walk down the steps and she fell down obviously because she was wearing my dad's pants mm-hmm. on her head. No shame there for whatever reason, no shame, but for what, I, but, but I put a kick me sign in first grade on a kid's back and I was, I can still feel the lump in my throat. And so it's significant for me because I've carried it around for so long. And I felt like the biggest piece of shit in the entire world. Um, and the, the, everybody got in a circle and the teacher's like, I need to know who did this. It's wrong. It's not okay. Mm. It's, it's really, really mean. And I, it was quiet and I was the, I was the murderer. I was the bad guy and I could not, live with myself. And I remember like slowly putting my hand up and gulping. I did. And I'm, I'm telling you like, why, why is this moment so cemented in my memory? And how am I not able, I mean, maybe I'm able to give myself, get myself off the hook because I was a kid, I was six years old and I was just fooling around. Um, there, I mean, like if my kid did that, I'd be like, okay, that's not cool. You know, apologize mm-hmm. to that kid and then don't do it again. No big deal. Right. I mean, maybe there's no answer. I just, it's, it's, a, uh, it's in my body. I'm still experiencing mm-hmm. it. You know, I do. 
is it about kind of having to sit with the fact that you were unkind and like caused harm to the kid? Yeah, I guess. Cause it was my idea to hurt them. Mm-hmm. And I did it because I thought it was funny. Yeah. And, and I got slapped for it and it's just, you know, when you think you're doing something funny and people take offense and you feel so terrible. Oh, yeah. Um, I just, I, I used to overstep. I mean, I still sometimes do. I'm pretty unfiltered and I, I'm pretty morbid and, but I would never want to hurt someone's feelings ever. And I deliberately tried to hurt somebody because I thought it was mm-hmm. funny. And it's just not something I I would ever do. I would ever mm-hmm. want to do. Ever. Um, like that's just not funny to me. Um, but I can, you know, I can be too morbid and I made a joke about my um a friend of mine had lost a friend of his and and I had we kind of joked about it because he wasn't really he hadn't really processed it well. It was pretty traumatic for him. And, and this was like four years ago. And I just said to him, here's another shame story. And I said to him, I don't remember what it was actually. I just, I was joking about his friend because I felt like that's what we were doing. That's because we, we both have a very morbid Mm -hmm. sense of humor and we deal with death in the same exact way. And, um, I said something and it really struck him like sideways Mm -hmm. and I could not take Mm -hmm. it back. And he started crying. (laughs) Oh, it was a very similar moment of like to try to be funny, not to try to hurt him though. And it did end up hurting him. And I cried hysterically Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we had a heart to heart and our relationships like, you know, been more solid ever since because I could never imagine hurting somebody like that. And like, it, he knew I didn't mean it, but it still affected him. And I still had to take responsibility for the fact that like, I hurt somebody with my words and, and, um, you gotta, you gotta own it and live with it and be able to deal with your own shame. Yeah. But, uh, similar, similar situations as a kid and as an yeah. adult, just gotta be careful. Especially like, you know, I would say post me too. It feels like we're all kind of being more honest mm-hmm. and being more forthright and louder about how we feel about the bad shit happening. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, I'm just going to make sure when I speak, I speak the truth and I speak my truth, mm-hmm. not somebody else's truth or like try to bring somebody down and Shame can teach you a lot, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, you got a funny one? <laughs> <laughs> that was really funny. That was great timing. Yeah. Um, I really thank you so much for sharing those. And, you know, I identify with a lot of it. What What's really standing out to me right now is is the, the common theme aspect, it sounds like there is, around, like, the capacity to do harm. And the fear of doing harm, like I'm thinking about like those stories and then also what we talked about with OCD and what, what we talked about, about like your one source of anxiety doing this podcast, being like hurting someone with your words. Like it feels like it's kind of ever. I think everyone has like core shame stuff that is kind of like the most likely to get set off. And it sounds like this is like a core shame schema for you. Yeah, I wish Tommy were here because he'd be like, <laughs> yeah, the like spe- his head would be nodding. He would be like he'd be ch- hitting his chin on his chest. It's just yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean that that's that's my brand. That's my brand of shame. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mine mine is kind of like I mean I have so many and we don't have I don't want to, we don't have time to. Get- <laughs> How lucky for me. We don't really have time for me to get into them, but um, I, uh, no, I totally, I, I totally identify with your story and 
it, it reminded me of um, a couple times when I like, as a kid also, oh my God, this one once in Hebrew school when I was in fifth grade, for some reason, there was this girl who was like kind of nerdy and I was a nerd, but she was like a bigger nerd. And I think I wanted to feel powerful um, because I felt so small. And long story short, I got this other girl to come with me to like the art room in our synagogue at Hebrew school and like destroy the, the paper mache mask she had made for Purim. And we like, we like ripped it up and knocked it with a hammer or something. And then we got called into the rabbi's office and, you know, justifiably punished. And, um, and I think the reason that story still sits with me is because of something it, it really brought up for me about my capacity to do harm and like, what is the spiral part is like, what is wrong with me that I had that impulse. And then I acted that on that impulse. Like I must be really dark inside, which if there's any like core stuff I work through in therapy, it's totally connected to OCD, but it's like a core belief that deep down I'm totally evil. Somehow everybody doesn't realize that, but I know. And like, so I feel like that moment just kind of became woven in to that, to that core belief that I'm still just oh. trying to deal with all the time. Yeah. Do you ever feel like kind of gossipy and like, I don't know, cynical at moments of just like wanting to just Gossip. Yeah, I love I love I mean, gossiping. Because I have moments of like that. <laughs> of course. Yes, yeah, same. But it can be so for me, I can be like my, my poor driver after work. Like I my assistant and I drive we live in the same neighborhood and in, in the city for because well, I'm doing a show right now and he hears everything. He laughs all the time because it's like we're not very mean spirited. But when somebody is not great or cool or nice or somebody's treating somebody else badly, we can attack yeah. that person. And, if, and and so there's a part of me that can be kind of a dick oh, inside. Yeah. And I used to think that defines me. Mm. I am an asshole. But I actually know that we all, that even the nicest people can have not nice thoughts and feelings about certain yeah. people and certain things and be able to discuss them and communicate them with the safe group of people. Mm -hmm. But like, it really just has to do with, you know, snarking on people that we don't like. Yeah, totally. And the reason we don't like the people are, it's only because they're not very nice people. And not to say that that's an excuse. I really wouldn't want my daughter to like grow up gossiping, but I hate to say it, but it's like, That part of me, the gossip part of me that like, you know, with certain, with my friends, it, um, it used to make me think that that's who I was. Mm -hmm. Um, because I certainly went with a crowd in high school, depending on the day. Um, and I'm sure we were mean to some people, maybe, um, I'm, I'm sure there were moments in middle school that I can't recall, but it's just like, when does that stop defining who you are? Like, when do you start incorporating the good parts? Yeah. You know? And like, that's the thing I want for my kids. I want them to believe that yes, they're, you're not always going to think good thoughts about Mm -hmm. people and you can share them if you feel safe to share them. Um, to relieve some pressure or whatever. But at the same time, that's not like if you are mostly kind and want peace and, and want the best for people, like, like just be a dick every once in a while. And then that's what I'm trying to uh, long, long way of ex- explaining it. I think that um, I know it's okay to not be perfectly kind all the time and have the, like kind thoughts. Cause that's not mm-hmm. human. And now I know that I can fuck around in the car after work and like relieve some pressure and tension by like, you know, (laughs) talking some shit every once in a while. Yeah. I think, I think. And it doesn't mean I'm a bad person. I'm not. 
No, you're not a bad person. And that's so human. Like we all, everybody is flawed. And there's such a difference between like having that friend where you know that privately you can be like, oh oh my God, can we please talk some shit? Because it's going to feel so good and it's going to be really fun versus, I don't know, putting that person on blast, being rude to them, like publicly talking shit. I mean, it's like... It doesn't make you a bad right. person to just gossip with with a close friend, you know. And was that my shame sharing that, or was that me and my mm. shame, or was that just me? I don't know. As a therapist, do you think shame was part of why? Well, I why that? would it be? I, I mean, like, wonder. do you think you're confessing, like, in a way that's like, are you trying to absolve yourself of the shame by talking about it? Yeah. I was just thinking that I'm like, wait, why? Because I was trying to think of, I was trying to kind of understand why I brought it up. And I'm like, is that, maybe that's partly shame talking. Maybe I'm trying to absolve myself. Mm-hmm. Of it. But at the same time, I also just think it's one of those things that's human. Yeah. And maybe I'm trying to absolve myself by saying this. It just, that, that exists no matter your, you know, your good intentions in the world. I guess if you keep it private, then it's safe. Yeah. I think, I think the impact in that context really matters too. Like you're not actually hurting anybody by privately talking shit to relieve some pressure and stress with your friend, right? you know, but it's so normal to kind of go there later and be like, what is wrong with me? Why do I need to do that? Shouldn't I be a better person and not want to talk shit? Like, am I being a high school, like mean girl? Like, what am I doing? You know? And, but I think that that whole narrative is the shame and there's actually nothing wrong with just being a person and you're not perfect. Nobody is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Um, we don't have too much time left, but I want to make a little room for some shameless self-promotion because you've been doing so many amazing things. You are so hardworking. You're like making stuff constantly. It's amazing. And I was wondering if we could talk about the dropout for a minute. Um, I love it. So Amanda, I love it so much. Basil and I binged it in a very intense way. And I'm s so, I want to hear anything you want to share about it, but also just in theme with this podcast, I was thinking about the dropout this morning and just wondering, like, okay, sometimes I ramble so much, even when we're recording. So here, here it is. I, I feel like something I loved so much about your work in the dropout was how vulnerable you made yourself. Like I felt like your performance was so raw and generous. Like you really, you went there with, with her and like, did I was watching and imagining like, Oh God, like what, just wondering what it was like for you to make yourself, to make yourself so vulnerable. Um, because some of the things she does are like, you know, they're hard to watch. And, and okay. So my question is basically just like, (laughs) did any shame come up with you like embodying Elizabeth Holmes? And I guess that's my first question. And then I just want, I would love to hear anything you want to share about it. Honestly, no shame came up that I can think of off the top of my head, but I think, I think what I really loved most about that show and being able to play her is that Liz Merriweather, the creator wrote in so many intimate moments Mm -hmm. by herself and with her partner that I felt seen Mm -hmm. (laughs) and therefore felt like it was necessary to go as awkward and intimate and truthful as I could possibly be. It was, it was, those were the moments that I had the most fun Mm -hmm. with because I could just be my most, not to put judgment on it, but weird. Yeah. My, the weirdest things that I might've done as a high schooler. I mean, we, we all like what, if we had a camera in our 
high school or middle school bedrooms game over. Like, no, thanks. I I don't, you know, I I don't know what I did, but I know that I stared in the mirror and pretended to be Claire Danes. (laughs) And I know that I played Mart will go on on my clarinet for hours Mm -hmm. and hours and hours. And it's just, I know I probably made out with a poster. Oh yeah. Of a backstreet boy, but it's like, we see those moments with Elizabeth Holmes and whether or not they happened. I mean, they happened. How could they not have happened? She was that she was a 17 year old in love with Steve jobs. Like, let's just call it like it is. I mean, she's Mm -hmm. one of us in Mm -hmm. some ways. And, and I was so desperate to, to, to have those feel as real and as awkward as possible, because it does kind of hold a mirror to all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, especially, you know, women growing up in, you know, the early, early aughts. Um, so I don't know. I just, it was a, it was a game changer for me. I got to do a lot of that stuff in big love, which was a Mm -hmm. show I did when I was that age, a little older. And, but this felt more, I mean, we needed these moments in the dropout because you needed to get the audience kind of on her side for a bit Mm -hmm. in order to f- have the full effect of, of her journey. And the, the only reason to make the show was to get the audience to kind of want to follow her yeah. knowing what she did, but like from a different angle and trying to understand a perspective that, I mean, we're not getting her off the hook. We're just trying to he- make her more human, which is the only reason to make any totally. show is to like humanize anybody. Yeah. And I just felt like I was able to pull out a version of me that I felt Maybe, maybe I had, did have some shame and I was able to like hang it all mm-hmm. out, you know, Yeah, which is such a cathartic experience oh, totally. and so fun and thrilling. It was the best experience really? ever. And maybe that's why you thought I lived in LA. You shot oh, that maybe. in LA. Oh, it, I'm, I'm so glad to hear it was such a good experience. Like you just had a great time. I mean, the best actors too. It was just the best all the best actors in Hollywood kind of came around and supported that show and just were as awkward and as realistic mm-hmm. and as funny as I think things were mm-hmm. um, without making fun of themselves as they're yeah. playing these characters. It's just a, such a, it's just a, such a gift, such a yeah. skill. Yeah. But it was amazing. It's amazing. And I got that role because of, um, the Oscar nomination for mm-hmm. me, like things, things happen mm-hmm. that way. They just do. And I'm never going to avoid that reality. Right. Like I got it because Kate McKinnon didn't want to do it. And I had just gotten the Oscar nomination that day. And they're like, Oh, what about a man's sacred? And then I was like, yes. So that's how I, that's why oh, I did that. Wow. life is so weird like that. You, well, you were, you were, it's so weird. It's, t- it's yeah. all about timing. You were so good. And like, I felt like you really, I could feel that you approached her with a lot of empathy and compassion and were like looking for the points of connection because she's not supposed to be easy to like, you know, like I was someone who'd kind of absorbed a lot about her story because out of interest before you guys did the show. And I was prepared to kind of just hate her, but I, I felt like I really felt for her. And even in the end when like she, you know, you see how thick her denial is and she's like impenetrable kind of in that way. But I still felt like, like it's, it's that feeling when you can see someone else's suffering in a way that they're not in touch with. And I just, it, it yes. made me feel a lot. I felt a lot. And I know I'm also like another white woman, like maybe I'm inclined to feel bad for other white women in some unconscious <laughs> deep way, but I don't know. I re- I really felt like you brought the empathy and it was there. It really, it was there. Thanks. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's a way, it's a good way to putting it, like seeing someone suffering, even though they're not in touch with it. It's like, that's like, walking through the world with compassion and just allowing someone to be an angry driver Mm -hmm. or allowing someone to 
be an asshole at the checkout counter or just allowing because it's just everybody's suffering in some way on some level and we shouldn't um It, 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 you know, it should be, it's like, I have to just accept that, uh, regardless of if they know it or not. It's just like, it's, you know, whether it's not, it's okay how people are behaving. It's like you, it's like you have to accept that somebody's suffering on some yeah. level and, and allow that to be a part of their story mm-hmm. or, you know, whether you know them, you know, with strangers, especially it's hard, it's hard, really hard when someone yells at your kid or something like I would want to just punch yeah. them, but yeah, but it's it, like, we have to show restraint or I don't know. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. Everybody's got their shame. Everybody's got walking around with a bag of shame. I know all sizes. Yep. All shapes and, and sizes. It gets activated by different things. And then sometimes you think you're like two adults having a conversation, but you're both, you're like, you're like a goblin and an armadillo. <laughs> And you're not actually having a grown up conversation. You're just these like shame amoebas trying to protect yourselves. Yeah. yeah. Can you? So I know that, um, you know, so if anyone hasn't seen the dropout yet, you need to watch it. It's on Hulu. And I know you have the crowded room. It's not out. When is it coming out? And what can you share with us about it? No. I'm sure it's spring and I'm sure it's, uh, it's definitely on Apple. It's really fun. It's set in the like late sixties and then late seventies. And I play therapist, which is oh, cool. you do? Which is amazing. Uh, I play, I do, I do. And it, it's great. Cause I'm, I'm fascinated by therapy in general. I've had a lot of it. I continue to have a lot of it. And it's fun to walk in those shoes, even though I always feel like I'm way too young to play anything. And then I, and then I turn around and I'm like, Oh wait, I'm 36. <laughs> oh yeah. I guess I could. But yeah. I, I always still feel like I look like a toddler. You're like, I can't, like I can't be a therapist. But, I'm a baby. <laughs> I know there's no way this is going to make any sense, but <laughs> and in, in, I mean, maybe, maybe it won't, but I'm, I'm happily playing it. It's, Working with Tom Holland, he's my patient. But um, oh, maybe I shouldn't say that he's my patient. He's definitely my patient, though. Um, yeah, it's it's an anthology series about mental health, which is another reason I wanted to do it. And yeah, the other reason I wanted to do it is it's set in New York, and um, you know, I just commute from the city to the farm constantly, and it's been great. And um, it's just great. It's a great cast. I'm working with Emmy Rossum, who I'm obsessed with. Yeah, she's um, awesome. I really am a, a big fan because she's someone who speaks her mind in a way that I could learn from. Mm. Um, so in touch with herself, also just clearly a good mom, new mom, mm. and a peer who I've always respected. She's just always doing like high, high, high quality work. And Um, I was scared at first. I was intimidated by her at first because she speaks her Mm -hmm. mind. And then I was like, Oh, wait a minute. That has to do with me. Mm -hmm. What does that to do with me? And, and, um, sorry, I just, I'm just so Emmy Rossum and, uh, and Chris Abbott, who I'm sure, you know, Mm -hmm. and a bunch of cool people, Tommy Sadowski, your has, isn't it? He's playing a detective who, my character has dated in the past, oh, fun. which I love. I love that. Oh story. yeah. That's so fun. Um, but it's about mental health and it's great. It's, it's, it'll, it'll be like a big, big streamer next year. Tom Holland movie star. Who's definitely not playing Spider-Man <laughs> in this um, because he's capable of everything, which is yeah, great. That's incredible. And hopefully it'll be done soon and stop working because Halloween's coming up and. Yeah. That's cool. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Hope it turns out okay. So um, we're going to wrap up soon, but um, 
a couple more just quick questions. One is like as we're kind of on the precipice of ending this talk, is there anything that as we've talked just since we started the recording that made that you said or did that made you spiral a little bit in like a meta moment? Or is there anything that you said or did that you think like later after you think about it might make you spiral? Oh, no, it was just, um, I'm trying to think. This is what I would do post interview. Um, no, I, I, no, just that I was noticing that I was probably spiraling a little bit, feeling ashamed that I brought up something because of mm. my shame. And then I'm like, wait, that's what we do. This is what we do. Yeah. And then I was aware of it in the moment. So I feel very good about it. Oh, God. That. That's awesome. <laughs> You found you sort of. Like, am I really talking about this because I'm trying to absolve myself? Like you're like you try, and I'm like I don't know. Maybe I guess so. Hey, it's okay to talk shit sometimes. I'm still a good person, but uh, like, is that my inner dialogue? I don't know. Maybe I love that we processed it in the here and now. It was so great. Yes, that's the thing. It's a good question because that's it. It just it happened in, yeah. in real time. Yeah, nothing to process. Yeah. <laughs> So there's always something to process. Okay. And my, my final question for you is I asked you at the kind of close to the beginning, um, not exactly because we kind of jumped right into chatting, but what, you know, how, how your anxiety was one to 10, like kind of starting the podcast and talking about shame. So now that we've been through like a whole shame journey together, how's your anxiety one to 10 about it? Um. Maybe four, mm. maybe one up. up a little. Yeah. It's just, it, you, you asked a lot of good questions. A lot of, it's very therapeutic. It, it's, um, I go through full days of not questioning mm. myself and my reactions and my experience. And And it's, it's okay. It's fine to do that, but it's also, it it is really nice. That's why I like listening to books on tape or reading. Cause it, it always makes me question th- things about myself. You know, it's easy to explore, but sometimes I'm just sitting on a beach and too wrapped up in like making sure my kids don't drown. Oh yeah. That I don't stop to smell the roses. And this is the same thing. It's like being present and that can always amplify things for you, which is okay because the anxiety always just goes up and down, but the more, you know, the better off you are. So I think it's a good yeah. thing. Well, it was so dreamy to have this conversation with you. Um, I felt, Same. I felt nervous about it, but, and, but honestly, it was such a good chat that like, I, I didn't forget that we were recording, but it was almost like I could have, like, there were, mo- there were moments, oh, there good. were moments where I wasn't thinking about it. That's it nice. is, it is. It was just so lovely to, to talk to you and let's hang out in real life with our kids. Yeah. Yep. Well, you're, you're, you're like only an hour up. Yeah. We're, but you'll be back. Yeah, and soon. you're working in the city and I'm about to be back. Although I'm sure you like run back home as soon as you can, but well, now I have to because she starts school in a couple oh. weeks. Oh, yeah. So I'm like – and Tommy's in and out because yeah. of work. So I'm like – because he's almost done with the show and doing something else. And I'm like, oh, God, is it that time where I'm going to have to hire extra help for yeah. my mom? Oh, man. Anyway, it's yeah. another day. Oh, my God. I swear I think that they're Oh, my God. Our, mut- our real-life mutual friends just arrived <laughs> at Amanda's home. All right. We're here here sans dogs. I'm so glad because it's just too much. It's a lot. It's too much. Okay. Um, um, Amazing timing. Um, I'm going to send them your love and also I'll see you soon. And thanks. And um, if I shame about anything, I'll text you. But it doesn't matter because you know what? I know who I'm talking to. You know know what I mean? We don't know each other very well, but it it does feel like a safe space. And I think it's a really good idea that you're doing this. I'm glad you're using your creativity for something that's so helpful. Thank you. Same. Thank you so much for joining us for the first episode of Shame Spiral. I had fun. I hope you did too. I only spiraled a little bit, um, kind of a lot, but I did it anyway. So that's good. 
We're going to be dropping a new episode every Tuesday, and you can follow the podcast at Pod Shame Spiral on Twitter and Instagram. And you can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Ellie Kremendahl. So stay tuned and spiral on, but not too much, okay? Okay.